at Memorial Stadium, not all the action is on the field. That's the sound of a functional MRI scanner. Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, is a test that uses powerful magnets and radio waves to create detailed pictures, in this case of the brain. The machine is a huge white cylinder. A volunteer lies on a table covered with a blanket, the top half of her body inside the cylinder. We were just able to get it here, so I think we're just going to roll through. In the control room, graduate student Zachary Cole is collecting data for a study dealing with attention, perception, and memory. The volunteer will be shown pictures on a screen, and while the functional MRI records brain activity, other equipment tracks eye movement. So we have eye tracking set up, and there's a camera that looks at our eye and it reflects back. Technician Joanne Murray can see the volunteer in the scanner through a large window and communicates using a microphone. So here we go. Our scan will last for about six minutes. Just do your best to hold very still. And, and then... The black and white pictures of the brain appear on a computer monitor. So the number is changing. I'm getting that set of 51 images every second. So when we're finished with this exam, we'll have almost 5,000 images. Why does Memorial Stadium house a functional MRI scanner? Right, so it's unique. There's nothing else like it in the world. Um, That's all, Carrie Savage, director of CB3, the Center for Brain, Biology, and Behavior at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The 30,000-square-foot facility in Memorial Stadium includes lab space and offices for researchers dedicated to understanding the brain and its impact on behavior. CB3 was part of an East Stadium expansion built on a unique partnership with athletics. There is nothing else like this in the world. Uh, starting with their physical relationship with athletics and the partnership with athletics, the scientific partnership with athletics, um, the diversity of the research that's going on here, the diversity of our technology that we have access to, the absolute cutting edge. We host people from all over the world who come here and every single one of them is amazed that we have this in Nebraska. Coming up, Carrie Savage takes us on a tour of CB3. He talks about the role the center plays in concussion research, and he has advice on how to promote brain health. That's this edition of Faculty 101. Okay, you should switch partners now. To be able to inspire young people. <laughs> Here's your final. It's really rewarding. I love the students. Welcome to Faculty 101, life hacks and success stories from Nebraska faculty. Time for orientation. Who is Carrie Savage and what is CB3? The human brain only weighs about three pounds, but it's responsible for our behavior, movement, and intelligence. Dr. Savage makes sure the students in his behavioral neuroscience class know what they're dealing with. The human brain is the most complicated known object in the universe. Um, we have uh, billions of nerve cells that form trillions of connections. So the complexity is just mind-boggling. Uh, we're just now developing the tools to really study them. Uh, for instance, functional MRI you know, has been around since the early 90s um, and it's become a very valuable tool. Ten years from now, there may be another tool that we haven't even anticipated yet um, to better understand the brain. So in order to do that, we need the scientists focusing on it and also to continue to develop our tools to study the brain in order to understand it's something that's so complex. With CB3, Dr. Savage is putting a stake in the ground to create a world-class multidisciplinary center at the forefront of brain research. Up next, lab work, a deep dive into research and creative activity. Back in the fMRI scanner room, Dr. Savage shows me examples of the types of images the scanner can provide. The strength of MRI is that it can give us so many different kinds of data. Uh, we get data about the structure of the brain, both its basic anatomy and also its connections, and we also get uh, information about the function of the brain. Images show slices of the brain from different vantage points that highlight structures and connections. One image on the screen looks like a brightly colored impressionist painting of a bouquet of flowers. 
And those colors that you see aren't just meant to be pretty, they're actually telling us the direction of the connections, where they're going left to right, top to bottom, uh, front to back. We know that from the colors, so we can tell where the connections are and actually where they're traveling. This is important, for instance, in our concussion studies because that's what appears to get disrupted is the connections. It's not so much focal lesions, individual lesions in the brain, it's the connectivity that gets disrupted. A hard hit on the field causes the brain to move inside the skull, leading to sometimes serious and long-term injury. The Centers for Disease Control estimates between 1.6 and 3.8 million sports or recreation-related concussions occur in the United States each year. Our desire is to identify biomarkers of concussion, concussion severity, and concussion recovery. So we'd like to have a better idea of what's going on in the brain when there's a concussion and how rapidly people recover, um, ultimately hopefully identifying biomarkers of um, maybe a player who's going to recover quickly or versus one who's going to need more time, um, and ultimately biomarkers of recovery. Is, is this person ready? As part of that effort, CB3 collaborates with Nebraska football and coach Scott Frost. Coach Frost not only agreed for us to scan his players, but he mandated it. And so every Nebraska football player, if he wants to play Nebraska football, has to get a baseline MRI scan. If a player has a concussion, then we get them in within 48 hours and rescan them again with a whole series of scans. Um, and again, on day three of return to play, right before they start contact practice again. Um, all of our scans are read by board certified radiologists at the medical center. Next stop on the tour, the Salivary Bioscience Lab. So this is where we bring the samples and analyze them. Um, Psychology professor Tierney uh, Lorenz uses the lab for her research on the sexual and reproductive health of women. We can um, uh, look at their um, endocrine components, their immune components. Um, we can even look at some of the genetic components as well. So lots of different things that you can get out of a simple saliva sample. Dr. Tierney studies whether sexual desire and arousal problems in women can be used to identify risk of cardiovascular disease. Another project involves developing technology that may someday lead to a more accurate and efficient blood test. The chance to work at CB3 provides unique opportunities. First and foremost, we have just an incredible resident faculty. Um, we have some of the brightest minds in this area. Um, I get to play with people who have expertise across a wide variety of um, different scientific fields. Um, being in an interdisciplinary center too really um, fits very well for the kind of research that I do, which is in and of itself pretty interdisciplinary. CB3 Assistant Director Maytal Nada uses the fMRI scanner and other methods to study chronic negativity and how people respond to uncertainty. She says collaboration leads to better research. There are a lot of psychologists in CB3 like myself, but there are people from a lot of other um, domains of research and everybody has unique perspectives and ideas and we're all very collaborative. And so I think that makes the research more rich. Um, I feel like even just in the few years I've been here, I've come up with ideas that I surely never would have um, without this kind of environment. Dr. Savage studies the brain basis of health behaviors. For example, using functional MRI, he scanned the brains of individuals before they started an exercise or diet program and was able to predict whether they would be successful. So for instance, we looked at and we have a paper under review now showing that we can predict weight loss, uh, how much weight someone's going to lose knowing nothing else about them uh, besides their brain function. And we showed that bilateral prefrontal cortex, so individuals who are more active in their bilateral prefrontal cortex, this front part of the brain that we know plays a role in impulse control and thinking about the future and delaying gratification, those individuals who activate those areas were the ones who lost the most weight. Um, so we hope that, you know, this will really feed into the push for personalized medicine. CB3 includes research across disciplines. Projects are varied, everything from improving treatment of stroke to learning how interacting with your dog influences your behavior. First of all, we have faculty from multiple departments and multiple colleges, and that's one of the unique things about CB3 is that we don't fall under a department or even a college. We fall over the whole campus. And so we have people doing all kinds of research. Uh, I talked about the concussion research. 
We have uh, political science research going on, looking at the brain basis of political beliefs and political communication. We have individuals looking at development uh, of emotions and um, sensory motor activities all the way from very young children up into old age. Um, so we have a very diverse portfolio of research. Ready for office hours? How did Dr. Savage get here? As a young student, Carrie Savage was always good at science. I think I've always thought like a scientist in terms of trying to understand the mechanisms of things. Uh, like what, how do things work? Um, and really trying to dig deeper and understand how things work. He started college wanting to be a petroleum engineer, but a psychology class sparked his interest and led to a new major. And I think that, that's a story for a, a lot of students, right? We come in thinking, you know, you're 18 years old, you're thinking you're gonna do something, and you're exposed to all these different experiences, and then you find the thing that really clicks. After earning his PhD in clinical psychology, Dr. Savage took a fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, where he was introduced to advanced imaging technology, equipment and techniques not widely available at the time. I was at Mass General during my postdoc, which is one of two places where fMRI was invented. So I was in the right place in the right time, and that really stimulated my interest in neuroimaging. And once I started doing this, it was over. I was going to be a neuroimager. So I kind of moved away from the clinical realm and really focused on neuroimaging research ever since. Prior to coming to UNL, Dr. Savage was a senior scientist at Banner Alzheimer's Institute in Arizona. Now it's time for a pop quiz. Random questions, life hacks, and wisdom for all of us. Do you have a habit that makes you happier or more productive? Yes, I'm a runner. Um, however, I don't care much for running on the road, on the sidewalks and things like that. I run on trails, on natural trails. Um, but then I also have a real interest in high, high altitude mountain running in Colorado. I spend a lot of time in Colorado, a lot of time in Colorado, and do high altitude mountain races. I have one coming up later in the summer that's going to go up over 13,000 feet. Uh, and will involve not just running, but scrambling, using your whole body, a little bit of climbing, and even some ropes to get to the top of the mountain and then back down. What is something you know about life now that you didn't know when you were 18? Oh, the biggest thing is I don't know everything. Uh, I thought I knew everything, and now, now I know how little I know. In fact, I know, not only do I not know everything, I know very little. There's so much about the world I still don't understand at age 56, and, and my education is what showed me how little I actually know. Do you have a motto or saying that you is sort of your mantra? I, I, I often say to myself, life has a way of working out. Um, and I say that when I have challenges, when things don't work out the way you want. Let's say, you know, I don't get a grant. You spend a lot of time trying to get it and you don't get it and you get terrible reviews or you don't get a paper published. Um, you remind yourself that this has a way of working out. Life has a way of working out and you keep plugging away. So you don't give up, you keep plugging away and life will work out. You hear a lot of things about the brain. Are there any of those that you can either support or say no nonsense? Right. Well, um, the only use we only use 10% of the brain is one of the biggest misconceptions about the brain. And in fact, I started my class the very first lecture addressing that misperception. And the reason it is the misconception. The reason it is I think it arose. Most of us think it arose from the early functional neuroimaging studies, the cognitive activation studies where they would show something like a language task and you'd see a left hemisphere activation. And people would see these spotty activations in the brain and say, oh, we must just be using 10% of our brain. Well, in reality, the whole brain is interacting all the time. And if you lose any part of the brain, you're gonna miss it. Um, we use our entire brain, 100% of it, for almost every activity. And now, graduation day. Time for final thoughts. One of the reasons Dr. Savage enjoys trail running is that it focuses his mind on the task at hand. It helps me not obsess too much about work, right? When I'm up there in the mountain on a ridge and I have to pay attention where I'm putting my feet and that's all I'm paying attention to is where I'm putting my feet and enjoying the beautiful nature around me. And evidence suggests healthy habits promote brain health. I spent two years in Phoenix right before I came here looking at modifiable risk factors for dementia, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there's really a growing consensus that there are things that can be done to um, at least delay the onset of dementia, if not prevent it altogether. Uh, but the biggest thing is, is uh, maintaining the metabolic health of your brain. And the way that you do that is you maintain a healthy body weight for your entire life if you can, for as much of it as you can, um, and you stay physically active, and you eat, you eat healthy foods. So it's, it's healthy body weight, eating healthy foods, and staying physically active. If you have to choose one, physical activity is probably the most important one. We are built to move, and if we don't, it tends to have a negative impact on all the organs of our body, including the brain. 
Experts know a lot more about the brain than they did a decade ago. But when it comes to this three-pound organ, there's still so much to learn. Well, the brain is the, um, um, the edge of science, basically, in terms of what we understand about the human body. Trying to understand, to me, gets me excited, uh, how do complex cognitive um, outcomes happen? Things like, like I said, memory, language, the fact that we can think about the future and plan for the future. Um, how do these arise out of brain activity? And uh, it's not just one brain area, but it's all these areas working together. And these processes emerge from that, and I think that's fascinating. Carrie Savage wants CB3 to play a role in solving the mystery. That's it for this edition of Faculty 101. In the show notes, I link to the CB3 website. Faculty 101 is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I think I was good at science. I always had an interest in science, for sure. Uh, in fact, when I was a young kid, I wanted to be an astronomer. And uh, my friends said, you can't do that because they thought I said astrologer. <laughs>